what we're going to be looking at today is linear modeling and what we're looking at is we're going to be looking at patterns and when we have patterns in maps we can usually represent those patterns by a mathematical formula and this is called algebraic modeling and if the relationship uses a linear function y equals mx plus b it's called linear modeling now the first thing i want to remind you of is this thing called dependent and independent variables so what this means is the value of y depends on the value of x because we can make up any value of x substitute it into my equation y equals mx plus b and then I would get a value of y. So the value of y depends on the value of x. So y is the dependent variable and x is the independent variable. And this is something you need to know. When we do it the independent variable is always the x and it always goes along the bottom of my graph. And the dependent variable is the y or whatever letter we use to represent it. And it always goes along this value here along the y-axis. So let's have a look at the examples so we can understand what we're actually needing to do. The first thing we're needing to do today is to be able to find the equation of a line. So here is a line and I'm going to be working backwards and I'm going to actually find the equation. Now we know that the equation of a line or any line is y equals mx plus b. That's what any line is equal to. So what we need is we need a gradient. And our gradient, we know, is rise over run, because that's what we've been doing. Now to do rise over run, what we actually need is we need a right angle triangle. A perfect right angle triangle, so that you, it has doesn't go over any not lines. I'm trying to explain this in a better way. So here, if you can see, I can draw in a right angle triangle. Here it is here. And what you have, it's perfect, it goes over, the, the line actually cuts exactly in this corner and exactly in this corner. So we're looking for a triangle that cuts exactly. Now I could have chosen a triangle here. So here I could have gone an even bigger triangle here. Or I could choose a triangle here, it doesn't really matter. What you need is a right angle triangle so you can have rise over run. So if I look here at this smaller triangle I've drawn, can you see I've run along the ground one unit because I'm going from 0 to 1 so that's one unit and how far have I risen 1 2 I've risen 2 now is my gradient in a positive direction yes it is so if I was to do this rise over run 2 over 1 which is simply 2 now remember this bigger triangle I drew can you see I've run 1 2 my bigger triangle and I've risen 1 2 3 4 so I still get the same thing of 2. So it doesn't matter where you get your triangle from. Now remembering that B is my y-intercept, I go back and look at my line and see where is it cutting the y-axis. It's cutting here at negative 2. So the equation of this line becomes y equals the gradient's 2. So that's 2x plus, now it would be plus B, but my B is negative 2. So instead of writing a plus, I'm going to put minus 2. And now we have the equation of our line. And that's all there is to it. So let's have a look at this one. I've got another line. Now look at the direction. It's facing in a negative direction. So I know my gradient is going to have to be negative. My y-intercept, I can see my y-intercept is negative 4 because that's where it's cutting the y-axis. Now to find my gradient, I need to form a right angle triangle. Now it's up to you where you want to do it but I can see a nice one that cuts in my axes here. Okay, so how far have I run? One, two, three, four, four units, so don't get confused about these negative numbers. How far have I risen? One, two, three, four. So my gradient is rise over run, that's four over four, but we know it's in a negative direction, so to compensate, I'm gonna put a negative sign in front of there. So my gradient is now negative one. So now if I write the equation of the line, I write y equals uh, negative 1x, so that's negative x, plus b, which b is negative 4. So it's y equals minus x minus 4. And to check to see if that's correct, what you could do is you could substitute a number in there. So you could try what happens when x is 0. Minus 1, minus times 0 is 0, minus 4 is minus 4, so that's right. And what happens when this is negative 4? Well, this becomes, when x is negative 4, that's negative, negative 4 plus 4. Minus and a minus makes a plus. Sorry, that's minus 4 here. 
So plus 4 minus 4 equals 0, which we know is correct. So you can just choose a couple of points and see if they work. So let's have a look at the next thing. The next thing is just some work from your textbook, just talking about that dependent and independent variable. So for some of you, it would be a good idea to perhaps stop the video, see if you've understood what I've said so far and answer the questions, and then come back and check the answers. For the rest of you, you might want to watch it. So Brett's organising a 21st birthday. The total cost of the party will include $200 for hiring the hall, $120 for the music, and $14 per person for catering. The table shows the cost for different numbers of guests attending the party. Which variable, the N or the C, is the dependent variable? Well, remember when we normally draw up a table of values, we have X on the top and Y on the bottom. So what you need to consider is that's how it normally is. So now we know that the independent variable is always the X part. So that means N must be the independent variable. So which variable is the dependent one? It has to be the C, the cost. That's got to be my dependent variable because it's dependent on whatever the X value is. Now the question is, find the gradient of the linear relationship between N and C. So let's not be scared. We still have a table of values, almost like we have X and Y, and we know how to find the gradient because we did that in the previous exercise. So to find the gradient, we need the change in Y over the change in X. Here's my change in Y, so 1720 minus 1440. Over the change in x, well, it's 100 take away 80, 100 take away 80, and what you get is 14. So the gradient is 14. Find the vertical intercept of this linear relationship. So what we need to think about then is to just be able to find the equation of this line. Okay, so for doing part C, let me change colours. I need to find the equation of my line first. Now we know the equation of a line is y equals mx plus b. Now in this case we don't have y, we have c equals mn plus b because I'm replacing the x and the y with c and n. Now the gradient we've already found from the previous question, so we've got 14n plus b. Now to find my gradient, I just choose a point. So let's choose the point 80 and 1140, and let's substitute that in. So the y value is 1440 equals 14 times n, where n is 80, plus b. So what we have is a very small equation that we just need to solve. Now if I was to solve this equation, and you can pause and do it yourself, I get the answer of B being 320. So the equation of my line now is Y equals 14, not Y I should say, C equals 14N plus 320. So when it says find the vertical intercept of the linear equation, the vertical intercept is the Y intercept, and the Y intercept is B, which we now know is 320. So the answer to this one is 320. So for part D, we've already just done it, so I've really probably done C and D together. The equation of the line is going to be C equals 14N plus 320. If this function were graphed, which variable would be shown along the horizontal axis? So if we think about it, this is vertical and this is horizontal. And we know the horizontal is always your X value. So which variable would be along there? It would be n in this case. What does the vertical intercept of this function represent? So if I was thinking about drawing it, I'm talking my vertical intercept would be here, which is 320. And the question is, what would 320 actually represent? So you need to think about how did that number appear? So that number actually appeared because it costs $200 to hire the hall and it costs $120 for the music. So these are the total costs of just doing this. Before we sell any tickets, before anyone comes, or before I work out what the cost is, my straight out cost is going to be $320. So this represents the cost before any guests arrive. 
Now to do this, you're going to need to always think about this as a real world question. Now part G says find the cost of a party if there were 95 guests. Well, if there's 95 guests, we actually know that means N equals 95. So we go back to our equation of our line and C equals 19 times 95 plus 320. We substitute back into my equation and we work it out and we get 1650. Okay, there's a lot of work going on in there but I'm pretty sure you're able to do it. Let's have a look at the very last question. Now some of you might want to stop but the rest of you might want to watch. Let's have a look. A criminologist discovered that the number of crimes committed per month C in a big city decreased as the number of police officers P patrolling the city increased. After graphing her data on a number plane, she found a linear relationship to be this. What is the independent variable in this relationship? Well, the independent variable has to be P because that is your X value normally and, the norm and now we have the X value being P. Copy and complete this table for this graph. So I'm just going to pause and put the answers in. You can all pause the video as well and complete it yourself. So this was a good question because we just substitute 50 for P and then 150 filling in our table of values as per normal. We also now just need to graph this on a number plane. So because this is only really, we're talking about police and crimes per month, we only really need my graph to be that first quadrant, which is why I've done different grid paper. So can you draw this graph on my grid paper just using the first quadrant? So you should end up with a graph similar to mine, except you would have labelled all your axes and done everything else that needs doing. So you can always show me and I can check this in class. Let's go ahead and answer some of the questions then. What is the vertical intercept of the graph you drew in part C and what does it represent? So what you needed to do is you really needed to work out, and it's not in the table, what happens when P is zero. And when P is zero, the vertical intercept is 3,250. And the question is, what does this represent? And what it represents is the number of crimes committed when there are no police officers. Um, part F then says calculate how many crimes were committed when 100 police officers are on patrol. Well that's very simple, we're just going to substitute into my equation minus 3 times 100 plus 3250 and we just need to work that out and I'm not sure what answer we get but you can because I don't think I've done the answer, but you can work it out. Calculate how many police officers are required to reduce the number of crimes to 1,900. So that's the same thing, substituting in, except now we know the crimes. Minus 3 times P is what we're trying to find, plus 3,250. And what we do is we have an equation. We're going to take this number to the other side. So when we do that, we get minus 1,350 equals minus 3P. And then we're going to take this over to the other side with a divided by, and we get P equals 450. And that's how simple it is. So with all we're doing, girls, is just looking at what we already know and now relating it into real world questions. Okay, have a go at the worksheets and the work in the textbook. And if you have any questions, you know where to find me.